I think we'll go ahead and start. Everyone um, for joining us today for this episode of SIDS Talk Plastics. My name is Anna Masolofa, um, one of the negotiators um, for AOSIS um, on this during this plastics um, uh, plastics plastic pollution negotiation process. Sorry. Um, and again, welcome to this episode, the fifth installment of the SIDS Talk Plastic webinar series. This is a series that was developed with the intention to encourage more discussions um, through, uh, including through knowledge transfer and information sharing on the issues of interest to small island developing states throughout the science process toward the most ambitious and effective plastics regime. And each of the episodes um, that we've had up until uh, now, and I think one more, um, before we go into IMC3, and we'll continue throughout the process, um, we'll cover specific areas of interest for SIDS. Um, I will hand over soon to the moderator uh, of this series, of this episode of, web, of SIDS Talk Plastic to talk more about what today's topic is, but let me just introduce first um, the moderator for our session today, um, Dr. Khalil Hassa Ali is a marine policy and governance researcher at the Institute of Marine Affairs in Trinidad and Tobago. With over 10 years experience in the field of marine policy and governance, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Sciences from the University of East Anglia, a marine sci um, master in science in environment and development from the University of Reading, and a PhD in maritime affairs from the World Maritime University um, as a Tasakawa Global Ocean Institute. Um, additionally, Khalil was a 2013-2014 recipient of the UN Nippon, UN Nippon Foundation of Japan Fellowship, where he received advanced training in ocean affairs and the sea. He is also a 2017-2018 Hubert Humphrey Fellowship recipient in the field of natural sciences, environmental policy, and climate change. He served as a lead negotiator for the Caribbean community, or CARICOM, on environmental impact assessment in the process to, to develop a legally binding instrument being negotiated under the UN, UN Convention on Law of the Sea on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological, bio uh, biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, the BBNJ agreement. So I'll hand over now to Khalil. so much, Anima, and good to see you again. Hello, everyone, and welcome to, as Anima said, this fifth edition of Sid Stokes Plastic. Uh, today, we have an exciting lineup, trio of speakers, uh, and today's topic will be about plastic pollution in small island developing states. Um, we all know that small island developing states, SIDS, are disproportionately affected by plastic pollution, including in the marine environment, Due to our geographical circumstances, narrow resource base, and unique vulnerabilities to environmental challenges. To compound the issue, uh, the universal and transboundary nature of the global plastics issue, with traces of plastics found as deep as the Mariana Trench and as high as Mount Everest, and as personal to all human bodies in, in our blood streams and, and organs, um, these, these plastic, the plastic is really overwhelm SIDS and their capacities to respond to the growing threat. Uh, moreover, as stewards of the ocean and seas, SIDS uh, share a close relationship with the marine environment and experience impacts of plastic pollution therein more devastatingly, particularly in fisheries with regard to our livelihoods, um, as well as in tourism and the aesthetic value of our surroundings. This installment of SIDS Talks Plastic seeks to highlight the key findings of research conducted by academia and technical experts from small island developing states who can best represent the relevant scientific, social, and economic dimensions of this issue within the context of SIDS. And as we approach INC3, this conversation intends to underscore the need for the instrument to take into account the special circumstances, priorities, and challenges of SIDS. In responding to yet another global environmental threat, SIDS have contributed to minimum. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, 
our our uh, panelists for today. Uh, first, we have Mr. Ofino Varia, a research fellow from the Asia Development Bank, uh, the, the Pacific Islands Development Program. And he also sits on the steering committee for scientists, uh, scientists Coalition for an Effective Plastics Treaty. We also have Dr. Roxanne Graham, newly minted Dr. Roxanne Graham. Congratulations, Roxanne. Uh, she's a research assistant at the Sasakawa Global Ocean Institute at the Royal Maritime University. And our final panelist here today is Mr. Mark Ram, lecturer at the, in the Department of Biology, Faculty of Natural Sciences, University of Ghana. So what we will have is each pan panelist uh, giving a, a ha having an opportunity to deliver some remarks. Um, and then we'll, we'll follow that with a question and answer se segment. Uh, feel free as, as the panelists deliver the remarks to post any relevant questions that you may have um, in the chat, and we'll get to them as we go along. So first up, I'd like to invite Mr. Rufino Vera from Fiji. Uh, and Mr. Vera would, would be giving a, a little talk on uh, plastic, the impacts of plastic pollution in the Pacific region and recommendations for effective national action plans. Let me hand over to Mr. Vera. Thank you so much, moderator, and greetings to everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity for me to uh, speak um, on this topic. I'd like to start off by jumping straight to the issue and saying that the Pacific region faces the impacts of plastic pollution in a specific, disproportionate way. Before I continue, I'm sure that many of you are aware of the arguments made surrounding the region's relationship with plastic pollution the first is that as a region, we contribute less than 1.3% uh, to the world's plastic pollution. And the other is that we have one of the highest plastic waste production per capita globally. And I want you to think about these two points for a minute as I attempt to unpack both arguments, uh, because the truth is that both narratives are true, but are never properly understood. And if we don't unpack the situation through an equity lens, it becomes easy to engage in like this playing game of who should be held responsible and how this issue can be fairly and equitably addressed. So much of the plastics that enter our region are through trade, through tourism, the fishing industry and discarded marine plastics are from outside of our region. And these transboundary plastics, they make their way into our waters largely via the ocean currents, invading our ecosystems and affecting important fishing grounds or culturally um, sacred sites or areas. And this is a large issue of waste colonialism that needs to be addressed. And please make no mistake, plastics in our oceans are pollution. And I have personal reservations about calling it anything else like debris or litter because those terms ignore the underlying problem that plastics cause biological harm um, and health deterioration. And it is a man-made product and it cannot be explained as something being above natural background levels like some forms of contaminants. So when I use the term waste colonialism, I want you to understand the gravity of its imposition um, it invades our waterways and important ecosystems like coral reefs, mangroves, seagrass meadows, causing nothing but death and by extension, creating these livelihood insecurities for people that depend on these areas. And for many Pacific islands, it's pretty much the majority of the population. For context, 80% of Fiji's population resides in coastal communities. And in my study, um, I found that some fishing communities on the southern coastline of Fiji's uh, mainland spend up to two weeks a month when out fishing or reef gleaning, removing plastics that are entangled on coral reefs, and many of which are uh, have labeling that is clearly not a product that is produced or sold um, in, our, in our domestic market. So this is a reality that I'm sure many other communities in the Pacific are also faced with. 
Um, and in the case of the argument that we have a high rate per capita of waste, uh, plastic waste production, yes, again, it is true, but we also have to understand that the Pacific region has a linear economy system with plastics. So we lack the financial um, and technical capacity to effectively manage waste production, particularly plastics. And we do not have proper recycling facilities, for example, we do not have waste to energy plants. Um, our landfills are over capacity. And most, uh, or most are not up to par with many international regulatory standards. Um, and it's also interesting to me when local consumers are told to make more responsible decisions when buying in supermarkets, because literally every item on shelves of supermarkets has some form of plastic packaging. So even the most environmentally conscious consumers can find it difficult um, since there are limited alternatives that do not use plastic packaging. And our region was the first to ban single-use plastic. So it's clear that we recognize plastic waste production is an issue in our region. But on the other hand, we also want to do something about it. And on the regional level, we have developed the Pacific Regional Declaration on the Prevention of Marine Litter and Plastic Pollution and its Impacts. And this acknowledges the need for more ambitious actions, including global and regional policy frameworks such as extended producer responsibility. And it calls for discussions on a global agreement to address plastic pollution. And on a national level, um, it is my position that um, because the, for, um, sorry, um, on a national level, it's my position that countries should focus more on national implementation plans instead of national action plans because the former is mandated, while the latter are voluntary commitments which often end up in countries shifting the goalposts instead of strategically working towards ambitious targets to address plastic pollution. And I argue that our national lead, our regional leaders rather should prioritize negotiations on the Global Plastics Treaty that pursue the recognition and enforcement of national implementation plans over national action plans. Um, and in relation to indigenous wisdom and traditional knowledge, I have developed a fact sheet that is currently in production uh, for, for SPREP. And I will share it with the EOC team for circulation once it's made available. But essentially, um, it speaks to the need to create uh, binding rules based on the best available science, traditional knowledge, knowledge of indigenous peoples and local knowledge systems under resolution 514. Uh, for example, in indigenous Fijian beliefs, we have this concept called Vadua, which involves three connections the territorial land, which is Tungele, social kinship, which is like Bewekani, and then the cosmological dimensions, which is Yavutu or Vu. And these holistic worldviews serve to address plastic pollution in its fullest relation, relational, ethical, and most complex way. So it's this systems approach to plastic pollution that is vital and yet currently lacking in the global plastic treaty negotiations. And uh, you know, in a translated summary of an indigenous Palauan uh, chant, uh, it exemplifies uh, their role as protective of the natural world. It says, the chant says, we are transiting this earth. We are in a way trespasses and we are really, and we really don't own what is here. We don't own the land, the trees, the forest, the water. Uh, it is only the rocks and the water and the core of the earth that own the land. Therefore, it is our responsibility to ensure its continuity into the future. And this chant describes a very different relationship to the human-centered, extractive relationship of non-Indigenous industrial societies that we should all learn from. And Indigenous Pacific Islanders' uh, roles are vital in shaping and implementing the Global Plastics Treaty. And they will greatly contribute to the science policy interfaces, um, but we need to uh, su we need their support uh, to secure full, meaningful, and empowering participation in the INCs, in the intercessionals, and the COPs. Um, and with that, um, I thank you for your time. I, I'll I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Mr. Vera. Uh, very powerful indeed, and and. 
unlike the, the framing of, of, of the um, classic problem as race colonialism, and we really look forward to, to you sharing that fact sheet on how indigenous communities can, can better be engaged in the class issue. Um, so thanks very much. Next up, we have Dr. Roxanne Graham um, from Grenada. Uh, and Dr. Graham will be giving a, a little talk on addressing the marine litter issues in, in Caribbean cities, um, tracing sources and promoting multi-scale strategies. So I hand over to you, Dr. Graham. You can start sharing your screen. Thank you, Khalil. Can you uh, hear my voice and uh, can you see the screen? All right. Okay. Thank you once again to the moderator, Dr. Hassan Ali, my fellow panelists, and everyone attending this uh, webinar. Today, I'll be quickly discussing some uh, relevant excerpts uh, from my research that can contribute to uh, today's topic of plastic pollution in small island developing states. And so my topic for this quick overview is addressing marine litter issues in Caribbean SIDS, uh, tracing sources and promoting multi-scale uh, strategies. So we know that uh, marine litter is a pressing global crisis that demands attention at various uh, spatial scales from local to regional to global levels. Um, we are well aware that it is particularly critical that small island developing states are prioritized for research and action as they are often overlooked despite facing some of the most uh, detrimental consequences of marine litter. Um, in the global pursuit to target the marine litter crisis, unfortunately, you know, small islands face unique vulnerabilities due to shared challenges such as high poverty, failing healthcare systems, limited capital, uh, substantial national debt. This is just to name a few. And um, this is unfortunately widespread throughout the Caribbean. And our islands are very dependent on the tourism industry, uh, fisheries for sustenance. And this is also being threatened by um, domestic and transboundary marine litter. Uh, plastic waste being the most abundant type of marine litter globally is said to actually be one third most serious for the Caribbean compared to the global average, according to the World Bank. And this is of, uh, June, as of June of this year. Uh, additionally, our economies are heavily exposed to the global markets and are largely import dependent, further exasperating our vulnerability to marine litter and plastic pollution. So to contribute to the region's approach for combating marine litter, I needed to essentially first characterize and understand the source to sea pathways on different levels, as well as the issues surrounding uh, management on different spatial scales as well to promote more tailored solutions. Uh, I would like to feature this research paper of mine that was published with Frontiers uh, earlier this year. The paper features the perspectives from key policymakers in the Windward Islands on the issues and solutions surrounding uh, marine debris. I just want to highlight quickly a couple of atypical source to sea pathways of marine litter here, like two, uh, the daily occurrences of overwhelmed trash cans, which encourages strays and wild animals, so like dogs, cats, and even goats in some instance, uh, to rummage and uh, spread litter. And this is considered atypical because it is, you know, like a daily nuisance and waste management issue that uh, people face and you know it isn't acknowledged enough. Uh, you see for many of these islands, bins are located near multiple open drains, culverts, waterways, which is uh, direct access for litter to enter the marine environment. Also, I'll highlight quickly uh, three as another atypical source, which was perhaps one of the most unusual and took some experts and researchers by surprise which is the increased haphazard use of old tires and galvanized among other debris to essentially serve as a uh, coastal barriers because of uh, sea level rise and consequent erosions and flooding. Uh, lastly, an important thing to acknowledge is the fact that there are numerous watersheds and rivers um, in the Windward Islands, which increases the likelihood of litter entering the marine environment during periods of uh, uh, heavy, you know, torrential rainfall and floods, especially. Um, 
Another important research finding coming from this paper is the fact that 95% of research participants identified establishing feasible treatment and recycling system as a national priority for dealing with marine litter. So that's um, like waste segregation, collection, treatment, processing, remanufacturing, and a lot of them also expressed a you know, huge interest in exploitation. Um, but this is a major research finding with respect to designing you know, future mitigation measures. Um, I just want to go over some emerging themes in my research. Illegal dumping near uh, coastlines and waterways is rising. Um, on one island, there are 29 point locations of illegal dumps containing mostly plastics as well as construction and demolition debris. Uh, this GIF on video here showcases piles uh, camouflaged with natural debris and it's spread across the remote beach on the island. Here, uh, illegal dumping uh, is basically can be considered like a so-called uh, protection of the shorelines that is happening. But unfortunately, this is a, a form of uh, say maladaptation practice. And with climate change and increased occurrences uh, and intensities of natural events uh, resulting in things like heavy rainfall and flooding, this does not help the marine litter situation, but you know, exasperate it. A recent flooding in Grenada, St. Lucia, and Dominica, and that's in the pictures here that you see, has swept communal uh, bin contents amongst other debris into uh, the ocean. So uh, this diagram here goes back to some of the blurred or gray areas of what constitutes illegal dumping identified by policymakers. I'll just quickly highlight um, examples of seven and eight here, which uh, seven represents the challenges in distinguishing between legal land uh, restoration and illegal dumping, which in a sense contributes to eight once again, which is the disguising of uh, illegal dumping by mixing the waste with natural materials such as branches, leaves, or, or soil. Um, lastly, when it comes to developing solutions, it is important to not um, also target just the, you know, the local issues via local means, but to also join forces um, to tackle this transboundary issue via regional and global partnerships and cooperation. Um, a perfect example is this year, the uh, United Nations Environmental Program, or well, the Caribbean Environmental Program, so the CEP, um, implementation partners, which I extracted from the sixth meeting of the a scientific and Technical Advisory Committee of the Protocol Concerning Pollution and Land-Based Sources and Activities in the Wider Caribbean. It's a mouthful, um, but essentially it's known as LBS uh, Stack 6. Um, so it was quite insightful to see the numerous organizations collaborating with UNEPSEP to achieve you know, the objectives of this uh, of the LBS protocol. Um, furthermore, there are additional entities not disclosed in uh, the figure, this figure here, such as like the Nature Conservancy, which is a global nonprofit organization, or funding organizations like the Global um, Environmental Facility, as well as GIZ and so forth. Um, so just a quick conclusion, managing marine litter and plastic pollution is crucial for preserving the socioeconomic fabric of small islands. Many of these islands rely heavily on several coastal activities, especially tourism and local fisheries, as the cornerstones of their economies. And tackling marine litter and plastic pollution is necessary to preserve these, not only, as you see in these lovely pictures, captivating but uh, vital resources. Thank you. Thanks so much, Roxanne. And I think it was, it was really interesting to uh, see the connection you, you were drawing the researchers as identified between uh, climate change and the plastic problem. Uh, not only with, with increased flooding, sweeping plastic deeply into the oceans, but also with regard to the the, uh, post, the, the adaptation and mitigation responses that we may have and, and how coastal protection might also be contrib contributing to the plastic. So thanks very much, Roxanne. Thank you. Uh, and now we, we staying in the Caribbean. Um, we're moving on to Mr. Mark Ram from Ghana, um, mainland Caribbean. Uh, he, as I said, Mr. Ram is a, a lecturer in the Department of Biology. And today, Sir Ram will be telling us a bit about uh, micro debris in, in commercial fish species in, in Ghana. So, Sir Ram, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, um, adding my voice to the issue of plastic pollution. 
So I'll be sharing some of the findings from research that we did here in Guyana that look at the presence of microdebris and the characteristics of these in commercial fish species. Um, Guyana, like Fiji, uh, we also, uh, we, are, we are a low-lying coastal zone, but more than 80% of the population resides on the coastal areas. And as a result of this, we're highly dependent on fish and fishing activities for our livelihood and fish as a main source of protein. And because of this, and we recognize that there's a growing issue of plastic pollution here. Um, and there, there are efforts, or there have been efforts to tackle the issue of, of solid waste management. However, there's about only 40% of our waste ends up into landfills. And that means that more than 60% of our waste are discarded in waterways, they're burned and discarded in other ways. And as a result of this, we've designed this study to investigate the abundance and the characteristics of these plastics that are found in commercial fishes. As we recognize that microplastic pollution is an emerging issue and perhaps one of the greatest environmental threats. With this study, we collected um, three different commercial fish species from three different landing sites. Uh, we collected 30 of each, each species and we looked at three species. One is the bagre bagre, or we call catfish here locally. We looked at banga, or we call that the macaron and the cyclodon. Um, and we looked at the nebris microbes or butterfish. And we collected these species, these uh, species, we transported them to the lab, and in the lab, obviously, we, um, we dissected them. We examined them for the abundance and the characteristics, looking at things such as their color, their shapes, their sizes. And these are all important characteristics because they help us to understand what is it that the uh, micro plastics looks like and if these mimic the food type of other fishes, uh, which is very important. In our study, we find that there were microplastics in all three of the species that we've examined. And these are, again, commercial species that Guyanese consume every day. Um, and there were very high levels in the bagre bagre or the catfish. In fact, the catfish had over 70% of all the plastics that we have observed in comparison to the other two species. Um, so there were significant differences in the species, but we're also seeing that the issue of by these microplastics, they're prevalent across different landing sites because we've collected the specimens in different areas. Um, we also looked at other characteristics. We looked at the color of these microplastics, and most of these actually were white or transparent. And this actually mimics or looks a lot like the food or the, the zooplankton that many of the fishes feed on. Um, and this is a, one of the reasons we believe that most of the plastics ingested worldwide because it looks like the item or the pre-item for most of the fishes. Um, we find that there were species specific, um, there were species specific characteristics, white mostly in the catfishes, but the other two fishes we found that they actually feed more on the blue colored uh, plastics. We also looked at the shape of these plastics, whether these were fragments, whether they were microbeads, they were filaments and so forth. And we find that most of the, of the plastics ingested were pellets. Um, and this actually is indicative of some of the types of materials that are discarded here, as well as other areas that might be transboundary in nature. Uh, most of the plastics that we observed were secondary microplastics, meaning that they were um, they were not created as microplastics, which are of a particular size. Um, these are broken down over time and have accumulated uh, are, are moving in the oceans and different ecosystems. We found also that um, that most of the plastics range between zero to five millimeters. Um, and this is quite uh, a significant finding because it represents or shows the variation in size of these plastics. And it also shows that they are, they continue to be breaking down in the um, environment, the marine environment. And we are going to continue seeing an increase in the abundance of plastics, likely in other species, not just fishes, and other marine organisms. Um, <clears throat> so overall, um, in terms of the findings, we recognize that the catfish or the bagre bagre, as I said earlier, had most of these plastics. 
but we actually relate that the the this finding to the feeding habits of this species in that this species is bentophagus and it feeds mostly on the seafloor. Um, they're considered generalists, so they have a wide prey pre, um, items that they feed on. Um, and even the morphology of their mouth allows them because they have wide mouths to feed on different types of prey. Um, so the morphology of the fishes are also an important characteristic in, um, I, in the deciding the abundance of these plastics that they're feeding on. Um, and this is an important finding for us. So these was just three of the species that we've looked at. Um, we, we are looking at other species, including sharks, uh, which are also a commercial species here, but sharks are also important because of their conservation status. Uh, we know that they face a lot of threats, so, so we wanted to see if they are also present in these um, in these fish species. Um, and we're expanding this to other commercial species that are landed in Guyana to paint a broader picture of what is happening. Um, so in conclusion, these are, are very significant findings for our country because um, it's actually the first record of microplastics in the commercial species. We haven't um, looked at humans or we haven't just looked at yet to see whether the plastics are moving up the food chain. Um, so they are scope or they are avenues for further research. But um, this baseline data shows that the plastics are present, that they are degrading in the environment and um, they are, we are finding them in marine organisms, which are also consumed by humans um, and other organisms right in their ecosystems. So our plan is to continue looking or to expand um, the species range that we will be looking at. Um, we want to look at other species, but we also want to look at it, look at the food web itself to look at the species that they might be feeding on. Um, to see if there's any move or the tropic movement of the microplastics within the ecosystem itself. Um, they also were planning to see if the um, if humans are also consuming these. These are areas for further research, but obviously there are many ethical concerns, um, especially looking at humans. So those are just some of the findings of one of the study that we've done. Um, as I said, more. We're publishing more um, on this topic and more literature and more research is emerging. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, definitely very interesting and, and great to hear of, of, the, of the great science that you all are doing um, and providing very concrete examples of, of plastic, uh, plastics in, in commercially important and, and uh, fish species that, that we use, like Guyanese and, and Many Caribbean movies for, for consumption. Um, I I just had a, a, a follow-up question for you. Uh, if if you have the answer. Uh, sure. so you listed a, a, a lot of um, future research research priorities. Uh, do you think that there will also be research into if plastics will be affecting the the, the reproductive um, ability of the fish? Yes, um, well, most of the literature actually shows that the fishes are affected in different ways. Um, their reproductive capability are affected, their brains are affected and usually cause blockages. Um, and you also need to look at different organs in the fishes. Most of the literature have only looked at the um, GI tract, um, not looking specifically to see whether they are moving into the tissues, but for these we require specialized um, instrumentation um, which we lack, I guess, here in the, in the Caribbean as well as, you know, most developing countries. So we're, we're doing research, but obviously um, there are barriers to the research that we're, we're, we're doing. Thanks very much, man. So in the future, we may, we may, we may see that uh, plastics are, are affecting not only the, the quality of the fish, but also the quantity of the fish availability for human consumption. Okay, thanks very yeah. much. You're welcome. All right. Thanks very much to our presenters here today. Um, we now move into a question and answer segment. Um, just remind to everyone on the on the call, feel free to to post your questions in the question and answer um, in the chat, and we'll get to them. Um, but while we wait for questions from the audience, I, I guess I have a few questions that that I'd like to ask. 
Um, I guess we, 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 we can zoom back out and, and consider, I, I, I'd, it'd be interesting to hear from the panelists today, um, your opinions on, on what makes SIDS uniquely vulnerable to the impacts of, of plastic pollution. I, I know a few of you touched on it in your presentations, but um, give us a, a, a summary of, of what you all think are the main, the main points that, that uh, we should take note of that makes SIDS uniquely vulnerable to the, to the impacts of plastic pollution. Um, I don't know who wants to take that question first. Uh, maybe Roxanne? Okay, sure, no problem. Um, I did mention a few of the uh, vulnerabilities in my presentation. So um, sure, yeah, so there are a number of, I guess, you know, internal and external um, forces in play. Uh, I talked about competing national uh, priorities, you know, so there is like, you know, high poverty, inadequate uh, health services, limited capital, um, in many instances, sometimes limited human resources as well. And then there's the fact that many of our islands are in substantial national debt. And then when it comes to talking about things like climate finance, um, perhaps what might be best for us is uh, uh, maybe grants instead of like loans, um, because we are in national debt and a lot of what is available is actually loans. So these are just some internal vulnerabilities, you know, competing national priorities that, of course, takes away or basically puts a, a solid waste management or marine litter management basically on a, you know the back seat. Um, and of course, I also mentioned uh, you know there are some external vulnerabilities. We are, and I think one of the panelists also talked about you know the issues of transboundary uh, debris, right? Um, so we, the Windward Islands, which is located in the southeast of the Caribbean, are exposed to debris that is coming from mainly two regions. And that is the North Atlantic, the North East Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Gyre, and and its prevailing currents. And then we're also especially um, affected by the freshwater inflow uh, from the Orinoco uh, River in uh, Venezuela. Um, a significant portion of freshwater from the Orinoco River, you know, flows through the Windward Islands. Uh, um, via the Green Grenada Passage. And I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Venezuela is essentially one of the most, uh, I don't want to say it uh, bluntly, but uh, it's known as one of the, the top 10. I think it's like an eighth position for being, you know, very um, polluted. So there is that uh, transboundary debris um, factor that we need to, you know, be um, aware of. And then of course, uh, um, another external vulnerability is the dependency on imports as well, right? I talked about that as well. The, uh, the islands are very heavily um, reliant on imports uh, leading to an influx of course of waste and particularly recyclable plastics because you know there's this, this increased recyclable plastics, but we don't have any recycling infrastructure to you know handle the recyclables. Yeah. So I'll end it there. There are a number of internal and external uh, vulnerabilities. Thank you. Thanks so much, Roxa. And and I know that. If you know, did make that point about about uh, lack of of infrastructure for things like recycling. If you know, you have anything to add to to what Roxanne said? Um. Yeah. No. She she really touched on that uh, really well. She covered everything that um I also had thoughts on. Um. Probably just to um complement um what she said about transboundary. Uh, plastics, uh, a really good example that I'd like to give is uh, in 2022, just last year, after the volcanic eruption in Tonga, they had a new island formation, the Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha'apai. And uh, uh, it didn't take like within within a month for plastics to, to find its way um, along the coastlines and even on some of the highest uh, peaks of, of, of the island, the newly formed island. And it just uh, goes to show and demonstrate um, how ubiquitous plastics are in our marine environment and how um, uh, it's able to make its way even to um, the some of the most remote uh, places um, that's untouched by uh, a human. So, yeah. Thanks very much, Rafina. I see a couple of questions coming in the chat for, for Mark. 
Um, this question is from Rebecca Reese. Uh, the question is, could Mr. Ram clarify his point about the majority of plastic ingested in fish uh, being in pellet form? Are these considered secondary microplastics? Yes, the ones that we do, the ones that we retrieve were from secondary sources. So they existed in the environment for quite a while before they were broken down by weathering and abrasion and so forth. Um, most of the plastics, uh, well, over 90% of the plastics um, that we examined were from secondary sources in the study. Thanks very much, Ma. Um, and, and I think I have a question for Rufino here. Uh, how can we encourage greater participation from, from relevant stakeholder groups, uh, such as academia, NGOs, CSOs, private sector, and indeed local communities and, and indigenous communities in combating plastic pollution collectively? Uh, I know you said you would, you would uh, provide us with the, the fact sheet that you were developing, but can you give us any, any insights right now? Yeah, um, I, I suppose uh, on, on a global level, when it comes to like encouraging greater participation, a really good example in terms of the INC process <laughs> would be like providing a greater funding uh, to allow them to uh, to engage in, in the negotiation space. Um, the reason why I say this, for example, is that like UNEP is providing uh, 20 uh, spots for NGO observers to, to attend this space. And this is um, available to like indigenous peoples groups, um, small island developing states and developing countries. And so there's, there's, there's this great cohort of, of people competing for these spots. And I think that's one of the one of the challenges that we really need to think about in how we can go about it, like providing um, financial support to allow uh, these NGOs and um, and CSOs to engage um, uh, in in this space. Um, when it comes to uh, engaging on a national or regional level, um, I really I do I do believe that um, there should be um, institutions like for example in the Pacific we have secretariats. Uh, that have been uh, set up to enable countries to be better coordinated in terms of like how how they how they come together and strategize um, not just among leaders but also uh, with uh, NGOs and CSOs um, and I think uh, in other parts of the region this is this is something that is that would be really um, helpful um, as well to have a body that is able to uh, properly coordinate um, these efforts and, and properly strategize. Thanks very, you're much, Rufino. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rufino. And, and do any of the other panelists have anything to add on, on probably ways to engage um, NGOs and academia and CSOs in, in uh, combating the plastic pollution? Anything to add? Has anything to add? Um, I, I'm seeing a question coming in, in the chat, and this question seems to be directed towards uh, Roxanne. Has Grenada done anything about marine plastic pollution in flux from South America? Um, best practices in sorting out plastic, plastics and sargassa. And there was mention that that there's a passage that goes through Ghana from Venezuela, and I imagine and this is from Ruth. I imagine it's connected to Brazil too, with the sargassum influxes. So I guess uh, what Ruth is asking is, is there a connection between sargassum and plastic pollution in the Caribbean? Roxanne? All right. Um, thank you, Ruth, for your question. Uh, so to address your first part of the question concerning uh, has Grenada done anything about marine plastic pollution that's coming from South America? The answer will be no. Um, we have been just making observations throughout the years. 
However, um, the situation in Venezuela, which is specifically because we've seen you know, the evidence that a lot of it is coming from Venezuela based on the packaging of um, the, the waste, um, because Venezuela is in <clears throat> that sort of political situation, we are not able to you know, work along to come up with, um, with possible solutions. Um, so what we have been doing at least uh, is uh, collaborating with, along with, you know, with the Caribbean in general, with uh, the OSPA convention um, that with, you know, that's connected to the Northeast Atlantic um, to essentially figure out ways in, you know, monitoring marine debris, um, as well as, you know, conducting cleanup activities and other um, useful waste management and marine litter, um, uh, you know, management uh, enhancements. Um, to essentially answer your question about Sagas, um, uh, yes, um, evidence does suggest that Sagas, um, uh, which is coming mostly from West Africa, is actually um, coming into our islands with uh, with debris. So I can confirm that yes, Sagas um, does contribute to um, marine litter. We have seen it. Um, unfortunately, even the most remote islands that's like Bekwe, for instance, are um, struggling with uh, uh, sagassum that is uh, containing uh, debris as well. We don't know where Bekwe is. That is between uh, St. Vincent and uh, Grenada. That's just for the audience. Um, and it's one of the islands that basically depend on, you know, the larger islands for, for help with, you know, issues that, that only the bigger islands can, you know, really prioritize. And if they don't do anything, then it's very difficult to get any you know, assistance. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thanks very much, Roxanne. That's a very thorough answer. And I'm also seeing that that um, Amrika made a, a, a comment, Amrika Singh, uh, that the link between plastic pollution and the sargassum influx uh, would also be that they're both driven by unsustainable consumption and production patterns. That's very true. Amrita. Very valid point. Um, I have a question. So we have we had some good points being made by our researchers here today. Um, in your research, and any panelists can feel free to answer this. In your research, have you really come across any effective? We, we've raised a lot of of the issues, but have you come across effective strategies to address plastic pollution in cities? And how can we improve on these strategies? So talking about uh, viable solutions, feasible solutions. Anyone would like to take this question? Maybe Rufino? Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a really good question. And I would say in, in my research, uh, because I, I largely deal with like uh, equity-based studies, um, on impacts of uh, plastic pollution on livelihoods, uh, livelihood securities, of coastal communities. So, uh, it, some of the initiatives uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't really re re call it uh, solutions. Uh, some of the initiatives uh, around managing um, waste uh, production in 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 villages uh, in Fiji, for example, is uh, is those communities who receive um, a high um, uh, influx, sorry, of uh, of tourists into their into their villages for like village tours? Uh, what happens is that uh, many of these uh, tourists uh, that come in, you know, they, they bring water bottles uh, with them, uh, plastic water bottles, um, and all these different sorts of um, uh, packagings. Uh, that uh, they have a tendency to leave behind in the village. And these villages, many of them are remote. They're outside of the jurisdiction of municipal councils. So they don't have their waste collected um, because they don't pay city or town rates. Uh, and they have a real problem of uh, of handling uh, these uh, these uh, plastic wastes that are, that are brought in. Uh, one of the initiatives uh, that communities have started to do is that when uh, when there are uh, village tours uh, from tourists uh, from tourists, uh, they're required to leave all their plastics. They're they're either not allowed to bring their plastics, 
um, into the communities or they are expected to take it back with them um, when they leave. Uh, the other thing that the community, uh, some communities have been doing uh, with the noticing um, how much plastic uh, water bottles are, are left behind is that they, they started to create um, accessories that uh, people can wear, like earrings and necklaces out of these, these items. I actually have um, one example of what it looks like, like that. This is from a plastic bottle. It's a colored plastic bottle, um, which in Fiji it cannot be recycled. It would have gone to the landfill anyway. What these people are doing, what the villagers are doing is that they're creating these accessories, selling them to the tourists and using that income to um, properly manage um, their waste by creating um like setting up uh, bins um, and uh, being able to pay for access into landfill so that they can have their waste transported there. Uh, so these are like small, small initiatives being done on a community level. Um, and I'm sure they're probably great, great examples uh, across, across other scenes. Anyone wants to add other examples? Thanks for those very practical examples, Ashwini. Um, perhaps I could mention about the single-use plastic bands. I, I mean, it's in other regions as well, not only the Caribbean. Um, so it is an existing strategy. How can this be improved? Well, perhaps uh, maybe I can talk about uh, very briefly the fact that the single-use plastic bands has created other problems such as uh, people uh, essentially smuggling um, uh, single-use plastics now, and it's basically being deemed as something, you know, illegal, um, like, you know, like if it's almost on the same level of the smuggling drugs or something, but yes, essentially, you know, smuggling um, plastics is becoming um, a huge problem. So I'm guessing, you know, more education is needed because the ban essentially came, came with uh, no research being done or anything like that. It was just something that we adapted, you know, and uh, um, ways to improve, I would think, you know, is essentially to, you know, enforce mechanisms for more robust and, you know, community driven uh, actions. And of course, you know, educate the local uh, populations on the reasons behind the bans. I think that is one of the main things that uh, um, we're missing. Um, another one is uh, extended producer responsibility. One of the panelists talked about it. I think it was Rufino. Um, uh, with extended producer responsibility for regions like, you know, the Caribbean, small islands, it's almost impractical because, like we, I spoke about earlier on, we are very import uh, uh, driven. So essentially what we have to promote in the meantime is uh, like retailer responsibility, for instance, incentivize people for wanting to bring back, bring back you know, recyclable uh, waste. Yeah, uh, that's my two cents. Thank you. <laughs> Very much, Roxanne. And I guess uh, since we we have these these researchers, Caribbean and uh, Pacific researchers here, um, I guess a final question we would have is how can we further support research in areas, both, both uh, natural science research as well as social science research? Um, in the areas that we've discussed within the context of SIDS. And I, I know uh, Mark mentioned a, a lot of uh, research areas that, that he would still like to explore. So Mark, why don't you start by giving us your thoughts on that question? Yes, as I mentioned, um, funding is a major challenge for research for us. Uh, we can definitely you know, create grants or provide, provide some sort of funding for small island developing states so that they can advance research in these um, countries and the impacts of pollutions, but also developing solutions for some of the um, impacts as well. Um, I think we could foster international collaboration as well, learning from countries who have gotten it right, leveraging from their experiences and um, for us to implement solutions to the issue. And we could also um, look at different partnerships from different countries right in, in our other uh, small island developing states that we can turn to for a solution um, to this issue. I'll allow the other panelists to add their feedback as well. 
Um, I'll probably just do a follow up from uh from what Mark essentially said. Um, like like Mark, I know that some people may um argue that there isn't enough funding made available in small islands, um, which is very true. But I would also argue that there isn't oftentimes uh grant opportunities that come and go, and our people essentially have problems, you know, being able to access it. Um, usually one. Um, because of course, you know, there are prerequisites, like, you know, you have to be um, a registered non-governmental organization or a community organization. And sometimes people don't even know how to, you know, go about official, officially, you know, forming one. Um, sometimes it's also the inability of these groups to also, you know, propose um, a winning uh, grant application. So I would think also that we have to look at these underlying prerequisites as well to address um, from something like this, yeah. Um, um, maybe I can add something else as well. We need to also improve, you know, our data collection and monitoring strategies. Um, we, and I mean via our Cartagena Convention, already have the interregional collaboration, like I mentioned, um, established with the OSPA Commission as a pilot project going on in Bernier um, to develop, you know, consistent and standardized methods uh, for data collection and monitoring of marine litter and to create you know, this enhanced existing national and regional database, which is of course very crucial. Um, this moment today where we're you know, exchanging information via this platform, I think um, that this is what we need, more uh, platforms and more information um, on sharing that is very necessary. So that's my uh, take. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Roxanne. And, and Rufino, any, anything quickly to add? I know we're closing, we close to time, but anything to add? Um, just to say that uh, not too long ago, two years ago, I published a review paper that looked at um, a gap analysis in research um, on uh, on plastics pollution and on pollution in general, rather in, in the Pacific region, and we found that we need baseline data um, around uh, around this uh, around the impacts of plastics eh, in in different environmental compartments. This is something that is greatly needed. And in terms of research, um, not too long ago, the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution commissioned the Lancet report. And they found that, you know, pollution uh, research is often neglected by funding agencies. And this is something that we really need to also address um, as well. And finally, uh, when it comes to traditional knowledge and indigenous wisdom um, uh, to the topic that I was on uh, today, um, I just want to uh, say that, you know, when it comes to the zero draft, um, this is only mentioned um, in terms of knowledge exchange. Um, and this is something that it's not perfect. We really do need to improve uh, the way we include um, indigenous knowledge uh, and, and indigenous wisdom in, in the INC uh, uh, negotiations to develop this binding instrument. So um, we need to think about this in a, in a better way, uh, rather than just in terms of knowledge exchange, yeah? including them in the discussions, uh, ensuring their participation and engagement. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. It's very much of you. And indeed, uh, very, very valid points. Um, I, I want to, we, we, we're up on time. Um, I just want to personally thank all our panelists for very insightful discussions. Um, and, and we really appreciate you all taking part in, in this uh, edition of Sits Talk Plastic. Um, I'd like to now hand back over to Anima to, to give some tools and moments. Thanks very much. Thank you, Khalil. And I echo uh, Khalil's um, comment and, and thanks and gratitude to our speakers today. It's been really good to hear about the research, your research, and um, your perspectives on the issue in the different regions, it's uh, yeah, in some ways a little bit terrifying as well, but it's good to know that there is research being done in the region, in the SIDS regions, and also by SIDS researchers on this very um, important issue as we go forward in the uh, negotiation process. So thank you very much to everyone um, for, for your contributions today, and also to all those who have uh, put, posted questions in the Q and A um, uh, section, and um, and engaged, um, and we look forward to more engagement going forward. Um, but for now, that's um, that's our episode for today. 
the next episode of the Sense Talk Plastic webinar series will be on the zero draft um, that was um, released by the INC Secretariat recently, um, not two weeks ago. And we'll look to hear some reflections on the various aspects and uh, sections of the zero draft before we go into INC3. But um, just to say thank you again to everyone. And um, that's the end of our episode today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Khalil.